Welcome back to Business Economics. I am Professor Phil Tomlinson, and in this session, we're going to explore the concept of firm strategy, and in particular, how firms can devise and utilize a strategy to be successful in competitive markets. In doing so, we will seek to bring together much of the material that you will have come across and read about this semester. We'll do so by using Michael Porter's Five Forces Framework. In this session, we're going to focus upon the economic rationale that underpins a firm's competitive strategy. This is obviously important, since economic forces undoubtedly affect a firm's market position and profitability. Hence for you, as future business executives, senior managers, or market analysts, it is important to understand such factors if you are, going, if you are deciding or advising upon a firm strategy. So, as in previous sessions, please take some time to go through this pre-recorded video, taking notes and pausing and replaying the material as and when to suit your own study style. Our aim then is to offer a framework within which we can understand how economics helps business people and also market analysts to understand the market environment. Doing so will enable us to answer questions such as, how do I tell how profitable a particular industry or market is? What are other key factors that affect that profitability? How might projected changes in the business environment affect a firm's performance? And what actions can a firm take to enhance their own profitability? And as mentioned, we want to utilize our knowledge of economics and e the economic forces that shape markets to guide a firm's strategic decision-making in formulating its own strategy. We begin by making an initial distinction between corporate and business unit strategy. Large corporations typically have many divisions and business units that may be dispersed across the globe. For example, Apple have business operations and business units such as offices, software development offices, design studios, manufacturing centers, development centers, sales and marketing offices across North America, South America, Asia and Europe. A corporate strategy, therefore, is, is one that is determined at the company's headquarters and it determines the strategic orientation of the company. Such strategic decisions relate to a company's human resource policy or a decision to diversify into other products or where and when to conduct foreign direct investment. Corporate strategy involves decisions that affect all the business units that fall under the company's remit. For Apple, these strategic decisions are taken at their headquarters in Grass Valley in California. In contrast, a business unit strategy is a choice of strategy at the level of the individual business unit. Here, the focus lies upon making appropriate decisions given the market environment faced by the business unit. So for example, Apple Europe will tailor its strategy upon things such as pricing, its advertising budget, and product promotions for the European market. In this session, we're primarily going to concentrate on the business unit strategy. Recall, the main objective of firms is to maximize their profits, and hence firm strategy should seek to fulfill this objective. In this table, we present some recent data on the profitability of several UK industries. The measure of gross profit is simply the profit sales turnover ratio expressed as a percentage. This is a standard accountancy measure to assess firm performance. When you look at the data, you may ask yourself why some industries are more profitable than others. Why do shareholders get a better return in say the water or cement industry than say in textiles? There are of course a number of economics based reasons for this largely based around market structures and entry barriers. For instance, the water industry is effectively organized around several local monopolies. You can only purchase the water that runs your bath or shower from the local water board. And even though the industry is regulated, these water boards can have significant market power. In contrast, in sectors such as textiles, there is much more competition. Indeed, UK firms have to compete in global markets with low cost competitors and therefore profit margins are much lower. In this table, we present some data for UK listed firms for the same time period. 
What is striking here is that some firms in the same industry have similar returns. For instance, look at Glaxo Welcome and Shire Pharmaceuticals. While in other sectors, such as water, while companies such as Wessex Water and Seven Trend have very different returns. Again, as an economist or market analyst, you need to ask why. Well, where profitability differs significantly in the same industry, it could be that some firms are not as well managed or have very different cost structures. In water, for example, it is the case that the industry is regulated and local water boards are required to invest in new infrastructure and they also have environmental responsibilities. For instance, being required to clean up beaches and sewage systems. These costs impact upon different water boards in many different ways and hence will affect their profitability. We can summarise some of these themes from this data. We noted that some industries are inherently more profitable than others and this could be down to the nature of the industry and market structure. And because of this, some firms are consistently more profitable than others because they operate in these favourable environments. And finally, firms with similar activities can have widely different rates of profit. And this may reflect the fact they're better managed and they may have a better strategy. This implies that a firm's external environment is a key determinant of its profitability. At the corporate strategic level, firms should try to be involved in playing good games, while at the business unit level, i.e. on the ground and in the market, firms should try to alter those fundamentals, i.e. try to improve their game. Indeed, as the data highlighted, there is still scope for firms to do well in relatively poor market environments if they have a good enough strategy to outperform their rivals. There are numerous strategy frameworks that you may come across when studying strategic management. These include, for example, SWOT, where you outline your firm's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. And there is also PEST, which stands for political, economic, social and technological factors. And in each case, you explore how these external factors affect your firm. There are also variants of these frameworks, and these include TOES, PESEL and STEEPLE. Feel free to Google these terms in your own time. Michael Porter's framework offers something slightly different, and this resonates with our earlier observations about market structures and a firm's potential profit. It consists of an industry analysis that allows us to peer inside the market and understand the dynamics of the competitive environment. And from this, it allows us the opportunity to formulate a generic strategy. Before thinking about strategy, the first thing you need to do is to define the market. And this is easier said than done. Indeed, many students and even firms often overlook this critical task. In defining a market, you need to think carefully about, first, the product scope. For example, think about the music industry. Are you competing for listeners in the broad music industry or just a particular segments, such as heavy rock, mod, punk, northern soul, manufactured pop or blues and jazz? Or think about the car market. Is your firm competing in the small city car market or the sports car market? or the market for family saloons. Second, you also need to think about the geographical scope. Where is your market based? Is it in Europe, North America, South America, or Asia, or several of these markets? And note, across the broad product markets, you may come across the same competitors in different geographical locations. For instance, the big music companies, such as Polydor and Virgin Music, often produce different types of music genre and in different locations. Similarly, the big car companies, Ford, Toyota and General Motors, each produce a range of cars, from small city cars to big family saloons, and again, they operate on every continent. Correctly identifying your market is important, because if you get it wrong, then you're likely to make incorrect inferences on the nature of competition, and this will lead to poor strategy formulation. For instance, if your market definition is too narrow, 
then you may miss opportunities and ignore competitive threats. For example, Sony were well established in the portable stereo systems market. Indeed, Sony became famous for the Sony Walkman, which was launched in 1979 and pretty much created this market. However, as new technology emerged, Sony became oblivious to the potential market for downloading digital music. However, Apple and utilizing its iOS software did see the potential and iTunes now has 70 to 80% of all music downloads and a similar share of the MP3 iPod market, which was Sony's traditional domain. You could also argue that Microsoft, the leading software producer, also missed an opportunity since it focused upon delivering software solutions and ignored the possibility of exploiting this in the context of digital music. As such, Apple stole a lead. Conversely, you might define your market with too broad a focus, with the consequence being that the detail will get lost in the big picture. For example, back in the mid 1990s, BMW purchased the British Rover car group. BMW's historic focus had been on being a niche high quality player, and they were purchasing a large manufacturer that catered for several market segments. The idea for BMW was to bring German efficiency and a reputation for quality to a mass market. Unfortunately, BMW lost focus with the acquisition. There were too many models in different market segments and BMW were unable to provide the required investment. The acquisition was deemed a failure and BMW pulled out and sold Rover in 2001. For Michael Porter, the fundamental question is, what characteristics of a market significantly affect the performance potential of the firms operating within them? Answering this question will essentially provide a categorization of the key influences on market performance. Porter hypothesized these characteristics to be essentially a function of the strength of five forces, and these in turn will shape firm profitability. We'll explore these five forces shortly. Before we turn to the five forces, it is worth highlighting the conventional economics view of how market structures impact upon firm performance. This is embodied within George Bain's Structure Conduct Performance Paradigm, or SCP for short. Here, you consider the market structure, which describes the degree of competition. And this in turn describes the behavior or conduct of firms, which finally has an impact upon firm performance. So for example, in perfect competition, we know that there are many firms selling a homogeneous product. Their conduct is that of atomistic price takers. And the firm's performance is conditioned by this with each firm pricing at marginal and average costs and taking normal profits only. In oligopoly, there are a few firms and their conduct is that of recognizing their mutual interdependence and there's likely collusion. And this in turn affects the firm's performance, which is likely that prices will be above marginal costs and firms will earn supernormal profit. This type of categorization still dominates within economics and the policy focus is very much upon promoting competition. For instance, by reducing entry barriers to markets, which we covered in an earlier session. In essence, way back in 1979, Michael Porter, and much to the chagrin of the economics profession, it must be said, adapted the structure conduct performance framework, and he made it suitable for business professionals. Porter identified five factors that affect a firm's profitability within any given market. These are the threat of new entry, the threat posed by substitute products, the bargaining power of buyers and the bargaining power of suppliers. And the final force is the intensity and the form of industry rivalry within the market. We'll now consider these forces in turn.
The first force is the threat of new entrants entering the market and stealing market share. As we pointed out in an earlier session, barriers to entry make it difficult for new firms to enter a market and compete with existing firms. High barriers to entry provide advantages for incumbent firms over entrants and allow incumbents to enjoy supernormal profits. Low barriers to entry will lead to new firms entering the market and driving down prices and profits. Good for consumers, but not for firms. Some of the main barriers to entry are listed on the slide. We explore these in depth in an earlier session dedicated to barriers to entry and barriers to exit, so we won't go into any further detail here. The second force is the threat of substitute products. Be careful here. These are not existing rivals products that fall under the initial market definition, but instead they're products that are functionally equivalent. The introduction of such substitute products threatens the profitability of an industry. For example, the introduction and take up of video conferencing technologies and the growing popularity of virtual conferences has hit demand and the profitability of physical conference venues. Similarly, the growth in video calling has reduced demand for traditional telephone services. An older example is the opening of the Channel Tunnel, which hit demand and the profitability of cross-channel ferry services. The third and fourth forces relate to the supply chain and the firm's position within it. The bargaining power of a firm's suppliers will have an impact upon its profitability. For instance, if you purchase your inputs from a monopolistic supplier, then the price you pay for these inputs is likely to be high, and this will inflate your costs and reduce your profitability accordingly. For example, if trade unions are strong, this might drive up wage costs in labour-intensive industries. In terms of the bargaining of power of buyers, well, if this is strong, and if you are negotiating with a monopolist buyer, then this will also affect your profitability since they can drive down the prices they pay for your product. For instance, there have been regular concerns about the bargaining power that supermarkets exert over milk prices they pay to farmers, reducing the profits and livelihoods of the agricultural sector. The bargaining power of buyers and suppliers is enhanced if there are few substitutes, or if switching costs to other buyers and suppliers is costly. The fifth and final force is that of the intensity of rivalry between existing firms in the market. This relates to the existing market structure. In essence, when rivalry is intense, then this will reduce profitability. And as we know from oligopoly theory, where firms recognize their mutual interdependence and tacitly collude, then rivalry is less intense and the market's profitability will be higher. Rivalry is particularly intense where there are many firms competing for market share and they largely use price as a competitive weapon. It can also be intense in situations when the market is growing slowly or is mature and firms are seeking to shed stock because holding stock is expensive. Similarly, in sectors where fixed costs are high, then firms must sell high volumes to acquire economies of scale and hence industry prices and profits are likely to be hit, at least in the short run. Okay, having identified the five forces that determine a market's profitability, Michael Porter then suggests that differences in performance between firms within a market will reflect their managerial choices and business unit strategies. Porter does, however, outline two fundam fundamental routes for firms to gain a long-term competitive advantage. These are either to pursue a low-cost strategy or, alternatively, a differentiation strategy. And both of these come with a warning from Porter. Firms should only try to pursue one of these strategies and not a combination of them. Otherwise, they will get stuck in the middle and will lose out. We'll start with a differentiation story. We've already explored product differentiation in a previous session, but here we'll focus upon it in the context of firm strategy. In essence, pursuing a differentiation strategy involves the firm making its product different from rivals. And this usually involves providing extra benefits or features to the product. Or even, they may use advertising to create the perception that the product or service being offered is of a better quality. 
Examples abound from across a range of sectors. For instance, airlines often seek to differentiate themselves from one another by offering more legroom or better in-flight entertainment or food. Cosmetics companies will differentiate themselves by adding different moisturising ingredients, scents, antibacterial agents, deodorising ingredients and organic ingredients and so on. Banks may offer personalised banking and current account features that include additional perks, such as free travel insurance and access to additional services or reward and loyalty points for using the account. This, differen this differentiation strategy, however, will involve the firm incurring additional costs and therefore they will need to recoup these additional costs in the price they charge for the product. The differentiation strategy only works if a firm is able to charge a higher price to consumers to cover the additional costs that are invoked from differentiating the product. This is demonstrated on this diagram, which shows the price and cost per unit for a differentiated product via v, a regular product in the market. The shaded area is a profit or price cost margin for each product. And in this case, it is higher for the differentiated product. Note also the cost per unit are higher for the differentiated product. So this is the case of your Waitrose or even Sainsbury's offering us a differentiated higher quality grocery than your run of the mill supermarket. Or it's your British Airways offering a few extras such as nicer seats and a small meal on its European flights. The key point with pursuing a differentiation strategy is that firms should seek to identify the sources of perceived high value for consumers and seek to cater for these through developing appropriate products. In this sense, research and development will also be important. Costs are important and firms will have budgets to adhere to. However, differentiators will typically be willing to incur higher costs if it adds value to their product in the eyes of consumers and they can recoup these costs through charging higher prices. Critical in this process is communication and commun communicating this differentiation to consumers and hence advertising is often a critical adjunct to such a strategy. The second type of strategy that Porter identifies is a low cost strategy. A firm pursuing a low cost strategy tries to improve its profitability by reducing costs to the minimum and then offering a basic product or service with no frills for a low price. This strategy will become part of the company's ethos and culture and will be actively promoted. In essence, firms pursuing a low cost strategy are largely appealing to budget conscious consumers. Again, examples abound from budget airlines such as Ryanair and EasyJet offering economy flights without a meal or extra legroom or bag space to low cost supermarkets such as Aldi and Lidl offering cheap groceries and basic packaging. The key point to remember is that in each case, the low cost strategy almost invariably involves reducing the quality of the product or service relative to differentiated goods. For firms pursuing a low cost strategy, the aim is to undercut the prices of other firms in the marketplace. In order to achieve this, firms may look to sell large volumes, especially when they can benefit from economies of scale and lower their average cost to production. The profit margin is demonstrated in the diagram, and this shows the price and cost per unit for a low cost product via V, a regular product. On the left, the low cost product firm has lower costs and charges a lower price than the regular product firm. Again, the shaded area demonstrates the profit margin, and in this case, it is higher for the low cost firm compared to the regular firm in the marketplace. In recent years, Porter has adapted his framework and offered a third possibility, that of firms adopting a so-called focus strategy. This is where a firm would concentrate on a particular buyer group or a segment of the product line or geographic market. It is focused on serving a particular target or segment well, rather than acting industry or market wide. By selecting carefully a segment and meeting the needs of that segment better than competitors who target more broadly defined segments, companies can gain a competitive advantage. It can exist as either a low cost or differentiated focus strategy. If a company adopts a focused low cost strategy, it competes against the market cost leader only in those segments where it has no cost of that disadvantage, such as small niches or complex products that do not lend themselves to economies of scale. If a company adopts a focused differentiation strategy, it competes against the differentiator by exploiting their knowledge of a small cons consumer set or a particular specialization within the broader range of products. 
Focus differentiators may also be more innovative than larger firms because the focuser is concentrating on the needs of just one type of consumer. Firms with focus strategies can provide a product or service at a price or quality others cannot offer. Examples of a focus strategy include IKEA, who produce low-cost furniture that you have to build yourself. It focuses upon young buyers in search of stylish and fashionable furniture and household accessories at a low cost. These are IKEA's targeted market segment. Another example is Zara, which has a focus differentiation strategy. Its focus is creativity and quality design alongside having a rapid response to market demands. By keeping design and manufacturing in-house, it is able to combine moderate prices with the ability to offer new clothing styles faster than its competitors. And this is especially important for its target segment, again, young buyers. Finally, questions have arisen as to whether the focus strategy is really a, a new third strategy. After all, it could be a subset of either the differentiation or low cost strategy. So which strategy should a firm choose? That is not an easy answer. But what is clear is a choice is made by understanding the profit drivers in the marketplace. And that is why a grasp of business economics really matters. Essentially, a cost leadership strategy is a price strategy. The aim is to raise sales volumes and increase market share by lowering prices and enhance profit margins by lowering costs. Price strategies are viable when the market is sensitive to price, i.e. where the market has a relatively price elastic demand curve. The short haul pan-European airline market is a classic example. Here, price reductions tend to attract significant extra sales volumes, which help increase economies of scale and lower costs further. In other markets, price strategies are not that important because consumers are more concerned about other product attributes. Paradoxically, this can arise in markets where the price product is relatively cheap anyway. For example, the bread market. Here, cutting the price of bread may not generate significantly extra sales to raise profit margins. In such markets, product differentiation can be important. Indeed, in recent years, there has been a rise in artisan bakeries producing niche, different and high quality breads with high profit margins. Of course, there are always exceptions to Porter's generic strategy guidelines. You may be able to think of some. Porter's choice of firm strategies might be summarized in the matrix on the slide. Essentially, it boils down to where the firm thinks its strategic advantage lies and how this aligns with its strategic target or segment. The top left and right boxes reflect differentiation and low cost strategy options when considering the whole market. And the bottom left and right boxes highlight these possibilities if the firm decides to focus on particular segments. And of course, for Michael Porter, no one wants to be stuck in the middle. Finally, it is important to note that Michael Porter's framework has been subject to critical scrutiny and there are some points that you should be aware of. First, Porter's framework is an externally orientated or market-driven or outside-in perspective on strategy formation. As such, it says very little about the internal organization of the firm. And in that respect, it is very much like neoclassical economics, which treats the firm as a black box in which inputs go in and from which outputs are produced. As such, Porter's framework relegates the importance of firm-specific resources, capabilities and competencies. Examining these factors are key to inside-out strategic perspectives, which we'll come across in your other management subjects. Secondly, Porter's framework is a qualitatively based tool. As such, it is difficult to quantify the impacts of the five forces model on industry profitability. Indeed, there have been no empirical tests of the model, and at the firm level, it is often difficult to ascertain appropriate metrics to gauge the extent of threats and opportunities. More specifically, Michael Porter is offering a generic framework, which implies that it is available off the shelf to all firms in the market. This is kind of counterintuitive, because if the idea is for a firm to adopt a strategy to gain a competitive advantage, well, if it works, then surely other firms can do likewise, and any competitive advantage is eroded away. Perhaps this is a little harsh. After all, 
might not Porter's generic strategies be broad classifications of strategies rather than specific strategies themselves? A further issue is that by adopting the framework, we might preclude the possibility of uncovering a genuinely innovative strategy. What we mean here is that essentially Porter offers a rather formulaic analytical approach that forces firms to think of the world in a rather constrained way, i.e. it doesn't necessarily foresee change. Yet some of the best strategies involve redefining the way we think of markets and products, and you don't really arrive at one of those by using Porter's framework. For example, Apple revolutionised the mobile phone market by essentially redefining it from a portable communication market, i.e. a device that simply facilitates calls and texts, to one that is essentially about handheld portable computing. Similarly, Dyson's bagless hoovers redefined the domestic cleaning market. Finally, Porter cautions firms against being stuck in the middle. But is it really so bad? There are several examples of firms successfully pursuing elements of cost reduction and product differentiation in their products. For instance, Skoda cars remain low cost, but they have recently established a reputation for being reliable. Such hybrid strategies are commonly accepted as being viable. Moreover, at the same time, firms that single-mindedly focus upon a particular generic strategy can fail. BlackBerry is a classic example. It started the smartphone revolution, but became vulnerable to attack by the likes of Samsung and Apple because it focused on a differentiator strategy targeted at business users and ignored the wider market. The core reading for this session is Michael Porter's article from 2008, which is an update on his classic 1979 paper. You should also take some time to watch the short interview with Michael Porter, which is on YouTube. The link is on Moodle. That completes this series of pre-recorded lectures on business economics. We hope that you enjoyed them and they were accessible for you. We will leave you with a Christmas equation. We would like to end by wishing you and your families a very safe and very happy Christmas. Goodbye.